Okay. Sigwa salute. I'm Lord Matre, the hip hop futurist. You're now tuned into the Super Longevity Institute podcast. This evening, I have a very special guest. He's involved in the field of molecular nanotechnology. He founded the Sci Nanotechnology Usernet News Group and moderated it for 10 years and served as the founding chief scientist of NanoRex Inc. He has written several papers on nanotechnology and developed several ideas such as the utility fog, the space pair, a weather control system called the weather machine, and a novel flying car. He is the author of Nano Future, What's Next for Nanotechnology, Beyond AI, Creating the Conscience of the Machine, and most recently, Where is My Flying Car? He was also a computer system architect at the Laboratory for Computer Science Research at Rutgers University from 1985 until 1997. In February 2009, he was appointed the president of the Foresight Institute until March 2010. In 2006, the Foresight Institute awarded him the Finman Communication Prize. He received both his master's and doctor degree in computer science from Rutgers University and his BS degree in mathematics from Drew University. He also was in the movie, The Singularity is Near. Ladies and gentlemen, hip hop futurist, transhumanist worldwide, Dr. J. Storr. Hall, welcome to the institute. It's a pleasure to have you, my brother. Wow, man! Thank you, and uh, cheers, and uh, oh, and, <laughs> and a toast to NASA for just landing on Mars today. Yes, I don't know if you yes. noticed that, but uh, they they had a successful landing of the Perseverance, um, wow. which was a cool thing. Wow, that's that's incredible. What I wanted to ask you, you, I mean, you've been doing your thing for a long time. How did you even get into the field of nanotechnology. What what wanted, what made you want to get into this field? Well, surprisingly enough, a lot of the people that got into nanotechnology early were computer people, and I was a computer person right. back in those days. And one of the things that were true about computers and have been for fifty years is that the smaller you make the parts, the faster it works. Mm. And so, computer people were more attuned to the notion that you could make things smaller and make them more powerful. Um, of course, you had to make more of them, but the, uh, that we were kind of already on that, on that train. And uh, so a lot of us understood that what might happen is that if you get the bottom line right, that physical technology could start improving the same way that computer technology has done mm. over the past 50 years. And if you know much about what computers were like 50 years ago, that is starkly incredible how much uh, faster and, and, and more capacious and, and, and so forth that computers have gotten uh, over just my working lifetime. Mm. And so we all thought, and we still think that, um, there's a way of uh, moving towards doing that with physical technology. Mm -hmm. And that includes everything from building buildings to building flying cars to traveling to the planets. Wow. So nanotechnology, is this um, artificial intelligence at the molecular level or is a one billionth of a meter? The super small. Well, it's, it's actually just building things at that building level. Things. You, you got to do, you have to understand more about how things work to do artificial intelligence than just build them. But um, just building them is a, is a darn good start. Right. And when you get both of those together, I mean, that's, that's actually what the flying car book is about is, mm -hmm. is when you have, uh, I mean, the, they've been building uh, vertical takeoff yeah. aircraft right. since 1960. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, there'd be, they'd be perfect flying cars, except that back in the 60s, every single one of them that they built crashed. And you've got to have a, a much smarter autopilot in your flying car than you do in your like Tesla or something. Right. Um, so, but that's 
something that we know how to do or we're beginning to know how to do right now. So that's actually um, two technologies that are coming together um, right about what the, uh, the great science fiction writers um, uh, back of the of starting in the 30s, but the 40s and the 50s mostly um, had a notion of what technology would be like right about now. For example, Isaac Asimov said, um, you're going to see some robots, but they're not going to be really smart yet, mm. but they're going to be there. Right. And that's just about as good a prediction of what robots are right now as you will see from 1950. Right. Uh, so these guys actually kind of knew what they were talking about. And, excuse me. Sure. Mm. What, what my whistle here? <clears throat> the uh, uh, so so you get the nanotechnology and you get the robotics and you put them together and you can have a machine that will build you a house in one day or you can have a flying car or you can have a spaceship um, probably a little too expensive for the average person to to have a his own spaceship, but still, right. you know, it'll, it will cross sort of like a train or a bus or a, or a, or a seagoing ship. Mm. And, and so that's, that's the world we ought to be in right now. And um, so my book is about a, what the possibilities really are and B what happened to keep it from happening the way that, that, that might've done. Yeah. Because it was like, a st I feel like, by the way, in the Netherlands, didn't they legalize flying cars in the Netherlands? I, I know I, I heard something like that. There's actually that several flying cars out there right now. Mm -hmm. um, the one from the Netherlands, if I'm, if I'm remembering right what you're thinking about, is a, uh, a motorcycle that transforms into um, a... Uh, it's not quite a helicopter, but it's a. Um, it has blades on the top, yeah. and it unfolds and so forth. And what just happened in the last week mm. was that uh, the United States actually certificated a fly car that's been being built for over a decade here. Mm. It was a bunch of MIT graduates that had this really cool idea for how to build a uh, a car that folded up. Uh, an airplane that folded up into a car and they're um i think they got bought out by a korean company but i'm not completely sure but anyway right now um they have just barely managed to get faa certification for their gadget as an airplane okay now here's here's the big problem and that's why you don't actually have a flying car the problem is the gadget in uh, the Netherlands that you were talking about has certification to drive on the road, but not to fly. Mm. The, the Terrafugia, the, the one that, you know, the MIT guys um, in America has certification to fly, but not to drive on the road. Mm. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of like a cash 22 there. It's, it's a hard road to hoe to get all of the, bureaucrats to line up and say yes at the same time wow well my question will be to you is how would nanotechnology um make the flying car better um well basically with nanotechnology you can make things stronger lighter more powerful and more efficient mm. and that's basically the sort of thing you need for a, a flying car a flying car pushes the edge of current technology a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the major thing that we don't have for a flying car is uh, a power source that's mm -hmm. powerful enough. You need something basically like a jet engine to make it right. really do what you want it to do. And uh, jet engines are very expensive. I mean, you, you can get one for a couple hundred thousand, but you really better off having one that costs a million because it's, you know, bigger and more powerful and more reliable. Mm. And so, and that's because jet engines are way at the, the outside edge of um, current day technology. 
I mean, you've got to you've got to grow pieces of metal that are single crystals to be the veins in your power turbine mm. in a jet engine, and they're going to be hit by gases that are essentially a blowtorch. Right. So you've got to build something that that is almost impossible. Um, I.e., you have to you have to you have to melt metal, make it set, and then use pretty much the best blowtorch we have just to push it around. Okay, a, a jet engine is, is, a, is a really amazing piece of technology. And yet with nanotechnology, it would be, it would be uh, falling down simple mm. to make a, an engine that had that kind of power to weight ratio. Mm. So that's, that's the big deal with nanotechnology is getting the powerful light engines that you need in the flying car. Wow. Um, I seen that. Um, I took a look at their design. It had like legs on it for taking off or something like that. Can you explain. I, I, I know I seen it. It was it, you had a unique way of how, how it would um, how it would lift off with these legs or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there's there's a, a whole bunch of different ways hmm. uh, that you could get a flying car in the air. Hmm. And as I point out in the book, probably the hardest part of it is making it do it quietly. Quietly. Um, right. Right. Yeah, if you if you wanted to take off in a in a flying car, uh, they back in the back in the fifties they had these uh, things they called RATOs, rocket assisted takeoffs, mm -hmm. and basically you you just bolted this solid rocket booster on the bottom of your airplane, mm -hmm. um, and the, and the Air Force had them. I mean, it, you 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 stick the whole thing on the truck and you drive anywhere you want, and the guy sits in there and you know crosses himself and prays. And pushes the button, and the thing goes, right. um, and the uh, and the rocket just throws the plane in the air, and and it's already at the once the rocket burns out, which is like five seconds, um, mm. the guy is already up in the air and moving fast enough to fly. Mm. So um, you could do that, but um, you don't really want your neighbor doing that every day <laughs> while you haven't woken up yet. Um, because it's a noisy operation. So the the hard part of the, the problem of designing a flying car in, uh, uh, in, in that technology or any other technology is simply that uh, it, it's hard to make that much power do something Quiet. quietly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Well, well can you explain uh, the, the Drexler motor? The heat? Yeah, that's the key. I mean, basically... The, it's just like the electronics in the computers. You make it smaller and it gets more powerful. And the reason is that you get tighter and tighter tolerances till, you, till you're building things that are half the width of an atom apart from each other in, in moving parts. Mm. Um, and so the, the things that you use to make the motor go, in, in the case of the Drexler motor, it's electric fields. Um, are uh, diminish with the inverse square of the distance between the objects. And when the objects are that close together, then the power is much higher. And so you can make these tiny little engines that if you were to um, build enough of them to fill the palm of your hand, I mean, literally this big, um, and, and hook them all together in the right way you'd have something that was as powerful as a 747 jet engine wow. um, so that that's one of the key things about uh, nanotechnology for flying cars or anything else right. you've got uh, um, the ability to put power where you want it without having to put big bulky engines and heavy and and, uh, and all that sort of stuff um, wow can you tell people who are for my audience who may not be familiar who Eric Drexler is, because we did mention his motor. Can you explain to my audience who he is? <clears throat> yeah, excuse me. Um, Eric is pretty much the modern father of nanotechnology. He was um, an undergraduate at MIT, mm -hmm. and he was working on a whole bunch of interesting science stuff, and he was a futurist. I mean, he was... Uh, fan of science fiction and like almost everybody at MIT is. Mm. And um, he started looking at the direction that um, 
genetic engineering and um, uh, biomechanical uh, science and so forth uh, were going. And he said, look, if we get even close to being able to harness this stuff, uh, we're going to be able to do this and this and this and this and all the, all the other cool things that uh, nanotechnology talks about. Well, so what he did was he got a whole bunch of his friends at, at MIT and they got together and they started studying it and they said, wow, this is really amazing. Mm. Um, so Drexler, without realizing it at the time, mm -hmm. starts writing about so forth. But what he had written about was the same thing that um, uh, Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, had written about around 1960 and which Robert Heinlein, the science fiction writer, had written about in the 40s. Um, and the ideas just got more and more well developed and, 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 and better analyzed and so forth. And so basically by the time Drexler got through them, uh, it was a thing and, and people began to understand here's a technology that we could have if only we just sat down and did it. Mm. And it, that's been true since basically since Feynman back, back in the sixties. Um, right. Go ahead. There's plenty of room at the bottom. The, the, was it an essay yes, or was it a speech? Right. It was a lecture, right? Yeah, it was a speech, but you know, he, he uh, found him. If you, if you read some of the stuff that he said in that speech, um, he said, in the future, people will look back on this and say, why on earth didn't we think of this before? It was just such an incredibly cool idea that, um, that he was amazed. And, and, and of course, somebody did. It was Heinlein. But um, uh, Feynman was the guy who actually put a sound physics and math basis under it. And then, uh, and actually out of his own pocket, he ordered, he offered the price of a new car to people that would take the first steps. And, and then he was kind of disappointed because people took the first steps and then they didn't take the second step <laughs> because yeah. nobody else was offering a prize. But then the Foresight Institute um, in latter days um, actually did and still does offer what in, in his honor is called the Feynman prize for people who advance the cause of, uh, of nanotechnology all right well, i want to ask you um nanotech explain to my audience who are beginners who are just starting to listen to you know um my podcast what's the impact what can what's the possible impact of non nanotechnology in the 21st century what kind of impact do you foresee with this tech this sophisticated technology well um it's kind of like what I write in the book, except the thing is, I don't come close to understanding all that is going to happen in a century. Right. I can just guess. Right. Um, I mean, if I'm, if I'm anywhere near as close to, say, Heinlein was in the 40s, I'm going to consider myself a complete success. Right. But the uh, um, one of the things is that uh, many years ago at, at, at a Foresight conference where we were uh, talking about this, me and one of the other guys who's a really top nanotechnology researcher, his name is Rob Freitas, oh, yes. um, <laughs> were sitting around after the talks and, you know, having a drink and, and, and just discussing stuff and so forth. And the question came up, how long would it take if you had a completely competent, fully developed nanotechnology as your industrial base? How long would it take to completely rebuild all of the capital equipment of the United States? All the buildings, all the vehicles, all the roads, all the uh, railroads, all the trains, all the ships, all the everything, okay? Um, how long would it take a uh, well-developed nanotechnology industrial base to do that? And we thought, well, that's a cool problem. So we both grabbed our notebooks and we you know, slide rules. Actually, we had chopped others by the time and started, you know, figuring and so forth and looked down and, 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 you know, five minutes later, we both looked up at each other 
and said, I mean, in unison, we, we looked at each other and said, about a week. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the creative power of nanotechnology. And, um, and, and, and so I wrote that old story in my, in my uh, flying car book. And then I gave the flying car book to uh, Rob to review and see if, you know, if, see if, if it was right, if you remembered what I said. And he says, yeah, I remember that. We, we, that's exactly what we did. Um, so this is where you start. Right. Now you think if you have that much creative power, you can build things that big, that fast, what could you do? Mm. All right. And I can think of all sorts of cool stuff. Mm. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I talk about in the book is, is uh, digging up the uh, um, floor of the Pacific Ocean and, and building islands all over it. Right. I mean, half of the planet, if you, if you go to the middle of the Pacific and look mm. from space, and you're looking right at the planet from the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you can almost see no land at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, half of this world is water. water. That's right. So, so you dig out the you dig out the uh, um, uh, the ocean bed, and you build islands, and uh, then you have you know twice as much space to live on as we have now. Okay. And everybody gets their own Pacific Island, or you know, every every few people. Um, I mean, that, and that's just a start. And then everybody gets a flying car to go back and forth from one or the other. And um, uh, you, if you want to go to Mars instead, you do that. Um, I mean, you 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 have the technology that allows you to take a planet and make it what you want. Now, the fact is, Earth is actually a very very nice planet. I'm very happy with Earth, and I've lived here all my life. But, you know, there's going to be more and more and more people. And we have lots of plants out there that, that just really aren't fit to live on. We can fix that. We can, we can turn Mars and Venus and, you know, the, the moons of Jupiter and maybe even some of the, the actual big plants themselves, who knows, um, into fit places to live. Um, I mean, that... It, Probably not by the end of the century, but we'd be getting there. I mean, this is this is what nanotechnology is capable of. Um, transcontinental um, flying cars, being able to uh, fly to like another country and stuff like that, that will be it will be possible with um, nanotechnology applied to um, flying. Cars. Oh, easy. Yeah, I mean, you could do that with a a, a personal private jet if you wanted to. The main thing in your way is regulations. Okay, you fly over a, a national border and, and they'll, they'll say, okay, come down here now or we'll shoot you. Um, so, the, I mean, we would love, we would absolutely love the world to be what the United States is now, where you can hop in your car and drive anywhere you want without filing a flight pan or um, any of the other stuff that, that that the pilots have to worry about. Um, but um, I mean, the major problem with that is, is that we don't have the legal system that supports it for the world as a whole. So that's, that's the first thing that you have to worry about as, as, a, as a flying car person is, is getting permission to do stuff like that. Um, the, I mean, right now it's 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 really nuts. I mean, for example, uh, you know, there 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 are ten different COVID nineteen uh, vaccinations out there. Two of them are approved for use in the United States, mm -hmm. but the other ones are approved for use in other countries. Mm -hmm. Why can't we use those? Right. Why can't they use ours? Right, right. Um, it's just a question of of you know all the little nations of the world want to do things their own way and they want to show that they don't have to listen to anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and so a flying car world where the whole world is kind of like the United States is where you can go anywhere you want without you know, stopping at, at customs between every state mm -hmm. uh, is really kind of what you would need to really enjoy your flying car to its fullest potential. Well, I guess my next question will be, what about air traffic? 
Can you talk, can discuss how that will be um, solved? If we have to yeah, play. that's where the artificial intelligence comes in. I mean, right now, I mean, I'm, I'm a pilot. I'm an actual flying, you know, have my own airplane and stuff like I that. So that. I, I deal with But that stuff. makes sense to me, yeah. Um, that would make sense. Okay. So the thing is that, you know, you get up there and you're flying along and you're going through all these different zones and regions and um, the over airports and, and in and out of military active areas and, and, and all this stuff. And what happens is that every single time you have to interact with the controlling agency for any one of these airspaces, you have to talk to them in English on the radio. Okay. Now that shouldn't be, I should have filed, you know, basically file a flight plan or anything else. And I say, um, I want to, uh, fly from a to B and there would be a computer that talked to my airplane and told it exactly where to go. Um, and, and all I had to do was sit there and watch and make sure something didn't go wrong. Mm. But the fact is, we have, I mean, my airplane has a, has an autopilot that's completely capable of doing that. Right. Um, what it doesn't have is a real time link to an intelligent computer in the air traffic control system. And yet there are thousands and thousands of cell phone towers that I'm flying over the whole time all within sight of my airplane. The plane is completely capable of knowing exactly where it is in space to about 10 feet. So the, um, the technology is there mm -hmm. for your flying car, if you had one, to be completely controlled in high traffic areas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you're not having to, to even pay attention to it unless you, know, you want it to or uh, you know, chances are it, it would be like the uh, um, uh, traffic controlling in, in your car where um, it says, you know, you have to watch this and you have to, you know, punch the button and say, you know, I, I agree if it screws up, it's my problem, not yours and, and, and all this sort of thing. But um, that's, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that, that we're going to have to tangle with mm. over the whole rest of the 21st century because, you um, our machines are getting smarter and smarter and we aren't right now we're already smarter than they are and they're going to they're going to come up to our level at some point right. um and uh and and the and the question is how do we deal with that mm. um and i frankly i mean i've written books about it mm. Here, here's the one that that uh, Beyond AI. I, was, yeah. I was saying before this is speaking of of, of cool pictures yeah, I love that. Uh, you recognize that? Yeah. That's on the Queen album, only the guy who did it. This is actually from a science fiction magazine published the year I was born. Yeah. 1954. Oh. And uh, so the and and uh, the the Queen guys thought that was so cool, they actually commissioned him to do a version of it with them in there instead of the spaceman. Mm -hmm. Um but that's that's what we're looking at. In terms of machines in the 21st century, we want our uh, machines to understand us and do what we want, mm -hmm. and that's a harder problem than you might think. Mm. Um, what's the chances of these machines um, uh, being unfriendly? How can we program them to be uh, ethical and not do what humans well, are to, to each other? Well, well, who, what we are we talking about here, Kim Osave? They, uh, um, in the United States, over the past 50 years, most artificial intelligence research has been sponsored by the DOD. Okay. They're specifically building machines to kill people. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of people. I, after I wrote that book, hmm. um, a whole bunch of people got into it and it, it, it turned into a, a field. I mean, people call it, you know, uh, friendly AI or AI safety or blah, 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 and all, the, all this sort of stuff. Um, but when I wrote the book, I had studied a bunch of moral philosophy 
And it turns out that in moral philosophy, one of the key ideas of the 20th century was that your ability to understand moral rules and act in a responsible manner was very, very similar. Probably even used the same uh, mechanisms in the brain as your ability to understand language. And understanding language was probably one of the hardest things AI has ever tried to do. When they started it in the 50s, okay, 70 years later, they kind of almost have part of it, okay? Um, so, I mean, there's no computer in the world that can understand what I'm saying as well as you can and vice versa. Um, so the, uh, even though there's some, some really fancy, gigantic, enormous computer systems that, that like Google and so forth are, are using to work on the problem, the, um, they're not quite there yet. And so about 10 years ago when I wrote that book, I was saying to myself, well, you know, I, I, I was in AI for most of that time. I, I mean, that was, that was what my career was about up till uh, about 1990 when I got over into uh, nanotechnology. But I said, now they, they put a huge amount of effort into understanding language. And here's a problem that is at least as hard because it's almost the same problem. How much, effort have AI people put into understanding morality? Mm. And the answer was zero. Yeah, yeah. And the reason that that's the reason that my book was the first book on the subject, because right. they just hadn't even been looking at it. Mm. So um, this, this is going to be a big deal, but mm. it's a big deal that, that people, even the people who study it now, mm. don't quite understand how big a deal it really is. Mm. Wow, is Ray does Ray is Ray Kurzweil still the chief scientist over there at um, Google? Isn't it his task to help them understand he, natural language to a to a certain extent? Something like he that. actually I was. Like that. I, I haven't actually looked recently to yeah. see okay. just where you know whether he's still there or not. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, he's he's been around for a while. He he may well be just you know retiring and and, and going to uh, Florida to he or something, mm. uh, but. You know he was he was great and and uh, um, and he was actually really into this stuff with me. I don't know if you notice the little blurb here on the top of the book is Kurzweil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to pick that so, book up. I'm um, gonna pick that book. Yeah, up. He was, he's he's a great guy, um, yeah. and uh, and he's very smart and uh, had had a uh, uh, a huge influence on on the ability of of AI. Uh, programs, machines, and, and, and stuff like that mm. to actually do useful things. He, he, he was the, I don't know if you've ever seen the Kurzweil keyboards or the, the <laughs> reading machine or all, all those. Yeah, I have the Kurzweil. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> right. What's well, so my sister? She's an organist. But oh, yeah, wow. they're, 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 oh. here's the Kurzweil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, first, let me say this. Um, I want to say rest in peace to Prince Marky D. He's one of the one he passed away today. Um, he was uh, one, of the, one of one of the architects in our culture. So I want to try to talk about nano medicine and what that can do to cure disease, as well. Yeah, because you know that was a, th this is a big loss for our culture. Rest in peace to Prince Marky D. Um, I definitely would like to know how can nano we we don't know I don't know what happened to him, but I want to know what. Can nano me nanotechnology applied to medicine? How would that help us live longer and fight disease? Yeah, well, I, I I'll give you. I mean, it's the same guy, by the way. Uh, uh, Rob Freitas is the author of a series of books about nano medicine, yeah, and he studied that a lot more than I have. Mm -hmm. But the basic idea is simply that there are some things you can't cure without being in the, able to manipulate stuff at the molecular level mm. i mean it, viruses stuff like that yeah, yeah. Um, and nanotechnology gives you the ability to do the manipulation to mm. uh, reach down in there and twiddle the viruses the way you want to 
The problem is that you also need to know what to do once you can reach in there. Okay. And that's a separate problem. It, it, you know, it, it's sort of like, okay, you know, here's, here's a screwdriver, fix this TV. Well, I don't know which screw to turn. Mm. Okay. So, so, you know, it, the guy comes to, to fix your TV and, and he charges you a hundred bucks and, and, and you say, well, I only turn one screw, you know, what's, what's the problem here? And he says, well, you know, that, that's uh, 10 cents for turning the screw and uh, 99.90 for knowing which screw to turn. Well, the, the thing about, the thing about fixing human bodies, which are probably one of the most complicated things that, that we ever deal with, mm. is that you both need the screwdriver and you know to need to know which screw to turn. Mm. And, and so nanotechnology first is going to be the instruments that you use to understand everything that is going on in the body. And the fact is that we have stuff like that. I mean, nanotechnology isn't just some pie in the sky thing that, uh, um, that's going to come in the, in the middle of the next century. Uh, we're on our way to it. We, we've done a whole bunch of stuff. If you look at what's happened in the, uh, um, the COVID, uh, where we have created some new vaccines oh, yeah. remarkably faster yeah. than anybody has ever done vaccines before. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And that's, that's the sort of stuff we're looking for. Right. And um, so there's a, there's a, there's a cool story. It, it's on my um, blog, mm -hmm. but people are talking about here's, the COVID vaccine, and we had it for a whole year, basically now, and all we were doing was waiting for permission to use it. On the other hand, people say, well, that's not true because we couldn't manufacture it. In fact, we're still not manufacturing enough of it yeah. for everybody. Yeah. And the truth is somewhere between the two. But one of the cool things is that it turns out that when you um, – try to manufacture an mRNA vaccine where the M mRNA molecules are encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle, which is how the stuff works. I mean, just ignore it. It's, it's, it's verbal, it's verbal stuff. But anyway, it's, it's the thing that is the, the stuff that the two um, U.S. vaccines um, are, are made with. Right. The bottleneck in the manufacturing process. The bottleneck is a little gadget that they use to homogenize the oil, the lipid, into nanoparticles and mix the mRNA molecules into them. Okay, it's a, a little bitty gut thing. It's, it's like a computer chip, only it, it's physical. So it has these channels for fluid flow in it and, and it does a and it kind of a nano industrial process and all that sort of stuff but it's not nanotechnology it's microtechnology right okay you could you could hold one in your hand and see it although it would only be that big all right so the thing is that those are hard to make and they're expensive and that's the bottleneck in the in the vaccine manufacturing process mm -hmm. so if we were a little tiny little bit further along the road to nanotechnology we would be a big step further to microtechnology and that wouldn't be a bottleneck anymore. And so, the, you know, the, the production rates for the, um, say the Moderna uh, vaccine mm -hmm. would be about 10 times higher because they wouldn't have that bottleneck and, and they could, you know, everything else is running 10 times as fast basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's what, even just moving towards nanotechnology could do for it. Wow. Um, can you explain what utility fog is? <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's a cool idea I had back when I was at, at Rutgers and, and running the uh, Sci Nanotech. And uh, it occurred to me that you could sit in a car, and this is actually true, right if you were sitting in a car 
and um, you are surrounded in the kind of form-fitting foam inserts that they put scientific instruments in, in 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 briefcases. You know, when you when you're transporting really fancy, you know, glassware or or, or this stuff, but they have these 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 foam inserts that exactly fit the, the the stuff that you're carrying right and you can drop them and you can throw them around and, and, and they all come out with no with no trouble so you're sitting in a car and instead of having a seat belt what you want is to have something that just as you're about to crash instantly turns into a form-fitting foam insert mm. okay and and, and, and if you had something like that, you could drive into a brick wall at 50 miles an hour without a scratch, okay? Uh, your car might get scratched, but you wouldn't get scratched. Right. So, so I said, how on earth would you build something like that? Right. And then I realized, like, I mean, like everything else that, that ever actually gets invented, you invent it and then you realize, oh, wow, you could do this. So um, I... Uh, I sat down and I started figuring out how, how you'd have to make it work and, and all this sort of stuff and so forth. And um, I realized at the end of it that I invented the holodeck, you know, the, the, the Star Trek thing where you just walk in this room and all of a sudden anything you can imagine is there right. and it can appear and disappear and so forth. And it's basically what it is, is you have, I mean, you and I are looking at screens, monster screens. And the monster, monster screen can show absolutely anything at once, and it can instantly change it from being what it is now to being something else, right. simply by changing the colors of all the little pixels all at once, right. right? Well, what if you're in a room where instead of having pixels on the wall, the entire space inside the room is like that, only instead of changing colors, it changes physical properties. So it can act like a gas, it can act like a liquid, it can act like a solid, and all it has to do is change just like that under program control. So wow. it, think of it as just being living in a 3D uh, monitor screen. Yeah, that's what it's like. Well, yeah. Okay, that, and, and, and once you've got that, mm -hmm. then your imagination can run wild because there is no limit to what it can do. Wow, this is like going, I mean... So how does this up? You said something about virtual reality in the book. You said that. Um, let me see. Yeah, well, that's what that is. I and mean, basically, right. you you can live in a in a, a completely computer generated reality where you can feel everything. Right. Okay. It's not just not just looking at a screen. You can feel it, and and if you program it wrong, it can cut you in pieces. Right. Okay. But so be careful about that. But the thing is that that can interface. I mean, here we are, and I'm looking at my screen, and you're looking at your screen, and it feels kind of like we're kind of in the same room or, or looking through a window at least at, at each other and so forth, right? Well, you can do that with, a, the, with utility fog, only it would be physical. So I could reach out and shake your hand, and uh, well, I will have to shake it in front of the camera, but you know, and, and, and you could feel it and vice versa. Right, so it's that's the the uh, transmitted virtual reality. But okay, and here's the really cool part: you're not limited to dealing with another person in another room. You can do anything you could do with like a camera or a microscope or a telescope, um, where you're dealing with something much bigger than you. And you you know you want to put up a skyscraper. You know you 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 set it so you reach out and you pick up these little girders. And, um, and, and, and put them into place and go and, and, and squeeze the rivets in or, um, or vice versa, you know, you're, you're manipulating uh, viruses, Whoa. you know, and you're, you're tweaking their little uh, uh, corona spikes uh, just to see what it's like. And you can feel it and you can play with the real thing wow. um, with, you know, with the shape shifting and size shifting capabilities of of the utility file. Wow. Um, I know a lot of hip hoppers that's listening to you hear this for the first time. This is incredible. Um, what about um, applied to, all right, another thing that interests me is life fiction. I'm a big life fictionist, and I, I you know, I think that um, aging is, a, you know, a, a problem that's solvable 
what can nano med can how can nano medicine reverse the aging process potentially? Well, there's a few things I talked about specifically in the book, um, and the that was ten years ago. I mean, that, that was a decade back, yes. and they know a lot more about it now. Um, so it's the same thing I was talking about when I was talking about um, uh, fixing your TV. The, you know, the nan nanotechnology is going to give us the ability to do the things we need to do, but the key is going to be understanding what we need to do. Um, and nanotechnology, like by virtue of being instruments and analyzing and, and that sort of thing, um, is going to help with that too. But the uh, the trick is to get people to realize this is something we can actually solve and and lean into it because that's been lacking. It's not lacking now as much because people are beginning to realize that it, it, it's a problem that we can yeah. work on. But uh, that's that's actually been the, the big drawback because everybody laughed. That's true. Yeah, you're right. Especially before that book, before your book, when your book, yeah, right. like what? Probably, I know you had, a, you guys had a hard time convincing people that this is solvable. Um, how do you? How, Cause I know IBM did a. Um, I know I read this before. I know IBM moved atoms or something to to make IBM at one time, and I said, "Wow." 1989. That was in 19. Uh, that was so long ago. This that was a long time ago. Yeah, that was but, that was four years. But that was a big thing when I remember when, being uh, able to just move atoms yeah. around so it spells IBM that was, and write IBM. Yeah, that so, was that was something. I mean, that, that was just that that was. Uh, um, I think it were no, they, they were the inventors of the. Uh, uh, scanning tiny microscope, but yeah. that's what they used to, to do that. Um, but that was just before the very first foresight conference on nanotechnology. Wow! Uh, and that was in '89, so that makes it easier to remember. I, I mentioned that because you know I know, like myself, a lot of us are just you know learning about these things, and I wanted to show people that even in 1989 we were doing stuff that leads to what, what what scientists like yourself and scientists are into today um how will we be able to make um because i know that i heard uh dr merkel talk about this he's another um non um technician he talked about oh, yeah. motors at the at that at that right at the atomic, like, at the yeah, atomic Stuff, and right. I know that has to be very extremely hard to do, and I know that you probably it will probably be take some different type of instrumentation than a um, scanning tunnel mi microscope. Cor am I correct? I'm yeah, yeah. It's gonna it's gonna take. Well, the the scanning tunnel microscope is about like being able to take a piece of machinery mm -hmm. and reach into it with your eye closed with a pencil and feel all the little points and say, okay, try and figure out what it is. Mm. Okay. And if you had a, a, a flat plate that had a raised print on it, you know, you almost like Braille, you could figure it out with that pencil. And that's what the, um, the scanning tunneling microscope people do. Mm. But what you prefer to have, if you're actually going to try and build something is something more like, pair of needle nose pliers <laughs> where you can grab things and pick them up and turn them and you know and all this sort of stuff so the key to actually building stuff with nanotechnology is going that extra uh, distance where you can pick things up and put them down and turn them and twist them and push them and pull them and and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. um and then basically you're pretty much there uh you can you could you can build things that way. You, you're looking at something kind of like a 3D printer, mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing what you can build with a 3D printer. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me let me show you something. Here. Oh wow. I do cool stuff with my 3D printer, and this is a uh, um, what is technically called a five-bar spherical linkage. Mm. But 
And I'm having, I'm having a hard time doing that if I didn't have a 3D printer. Well, the thing is that, that the stuff that they, they intend to build things in nanotechnology with are like that. And basically it takes the basic ability to do this stuff and a lot of ingenuity to decide how you can use that to build the pieces you need. And I, I, I mean, it, it's really hard to make a, a prediction that people won't laugh at 10 years from now. Yeah. But I would say that 10 years from now, we'd be, we'll be doing that. Wow, that's, that's incredible. I think, I I think this is probably about right. And oh. Kurtzfeld says the same. <laughs> wow, yeah. um, what are you flying right now? Oh, right, before I even ask that, is that koala bear real in your picture? I was like, he's holding the koala bear. Is that real? Is that a real koala bear you're holding? It absolutely is. <laughs> yep. Oh, wow. What was that? Where, where were you at when you was holding that koala bear? I was roughly the same time period. I think it may be, maybe 91. Wow. Uh, we, we, my wife and I took our vacation down to Australia. And, right. That's what, right. Uh, and the cool thing about the uh, nature parks in Australia is that you go in, you know, it's like a zoo, only you get to walk in with the animals because none of them is, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. None of the animals in the zoos are dangerous. Okay, they don't have lions, they don't have tigers. Um, what they do have, every single snake and lizard is poisonous. Yeah. Okay, so they don't put those in the zoos. Right. But, um, but, you know, the big things like the kangaroos and the koalas and so forth, they're all fuzzy and, you know, you, yeah, you, you have fun with them. What are you flying and how long you was a pilot? Uh, about 10 years. I have a uh, Beechcraft Sundowner, mm. oh. which is uh, fun. Um, how can nanotechnology uh, help with hunger and poverty? I had to ask that. I know I missed some of that. Well, basically, if you have the technology to rebuild everything in the United States in a week, uh, you have the ability to uh, build so much stuff that it doesn't matter if you give a bunch of it away. Um, mm. And uh, so I don't see, once nanotechnology gets going, I don't see anybody being hungry. It's just a, a question of, um, you know, you go into a, a restaurant and they give you a glass of water because it, you know it's so cheap they don't bother to charge you for it. Same thing with food um, in the nanotechnology era. Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna starve. Um, the main thing that people don't realize is that when you have a whole bunch of people who are uh, essentially rich, then it's not being rich that they're going to care about. They're going to care about status of other kinds. Right. And I really have no clue what that's going to be. No, I, but yeah, um, right. but it, don't, don't think that once everybody gets enough to eat, that they're all going to be happy. You know, they, they're going to be happy because, you know, they're not allowed to wear purple clothes or something. Um, <laughs> just, I, I totally get it. I, totally I mean, that's that. happened. That, it, it used to be the prerogative of king was the only person who could wear purple clothes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That could happen. I mean, it, like I said, it's happened. So, wow. it, you know, it, there's always going to be something to complain about. Just, you know, don't don't think this is going to be completely right. uh, uh, it, you know, free. But the but the basics, like, you know, people not starving in the streets um, is is very likely to, to, to be uh, completely taken care of and, and nobody will even think that, that something's got to starve. Well, that's some good news. I mean, you know, I think that's great news. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we hear so much of the, the, you know, Hollywood's done a job with the gloom and doom of technology. It's good to hear some good news that the technology may be to uh, help humanity instead of the bad news. And I, kn I know there's a lot of... You are so right. Yes, this is great. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong with technology of any sort. Um, But, um, yeah, you, I want to show... Wait, I want to show your book because I have a picture of it. I want to show your book on the flying cars real quick. 
So this okay. is how it looks. Where's my flying that's car? Book. Yep, that's the one. And um, if you mm -hmm. want to go purchase it, where can they get it? It's on Kindle. And unfortunately, right now, it's only on Kindle. Mm. So you're going to have to get it in electronic form. But as I was saying before, um, Stripe Press is coming out with a hardback version of it. Um, we still don't know exactly what the cover is going to look like. But okay. um, it's the book. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the text is the book. So, um, and when I wrote that, it took me eight years. It took me two years to write my other two books each. Mm. And it took me eight years to write this one because once I got really going into it, I realized that the problems with flying cars are not technological problems. They're, they're mostly sociological problems. Mm. And, and, um, problems of regulation and, and yeah. uh, all the rest of it. And so it turned into my intellectual memoir. I had basically just retired, and I said, okay, you know, may as well sit here. I'm you know, the old man. I would tell all the cool stories and, and, and uh, uh, you know, give everybody the, the benefit, ha, 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 of my vast experience. And so that's what that is. And it's a huge, huge book. We're, we're, we're editing it down a little bit, so it won't be so, so long-winded uh, when we make a, uh, uh, a paper book out of it. But uh, – that's that's basically what it is, and and I look at a lot of the questions of the kind that we've just been talking about here. Yeah, because we're you know I know I used to, I used to watch suggestions. I was like you know I know that the technology is feasible. I was like what's what, what was all the stagnation about? But as you said, yeah. it's the social, um, pro, you know, thing that helped that yeah. um, prevented this flying for flying cars. But I can you know I can give you an I can give you an example. Okay. In the 50 years from the Wright brothers to when I grew up and watched the moon landing and went to college, mm -hmm. end of the 60s, aviation went from the Wright brothers' box kite airplane mm -hmm. to the 747. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so by the time I went to college, you could get a ride on the 747. In the 50 years since then, Aviation has gone from the 747 to the 747. Mm. It has just flatlined. And that's the stagnation in one little example from, from uh, wow. aviation. Wow. Wow. Um, and I know I read somewhere that, you know, applying molecular um, manufacturing to flying cars will, will probably get pe other people interested in molecular manufacturing, nanotechnology, right? I would certainly hope so. Yeah, that would be really great. Yeah, I, I hope so too. <laughs> I want to show you other books too. I want to show the Nano Future book also. This one looks. Let's see. Yeah, that's his Nano Future. Uh, please. And that, you know that's what? actually. Yeah, you, know, you were talking about Eric Dressler. He actually produced that picture. Um, that was from the cover of uh, Chemical Engineering News magazine, in which Drexler had a debate running over several issues about nanotechnology with um, uh, one of the, the main chemists that was kind of on the other side of the, of the aisle there. And so they got that as the cover, Drexler produced that for them, and, uh, and uh, they got that. And then I talked to Eric, who was you know, my big friend at the time, and uh, got his permission to use that as the cover of my book. So uh, that's where that came from. Anybody interested in nanotechnology after seeing this, please pick up that book and pick up Where's My Flying Car, please. You're going to get, you're going to be in for a treat because it's still, I, it was written like 10 years ago, but tr trust me, it's still very relevant today. Extremely relevant today. Oh, yeah. And it's easy, uh, easy, not, very good. Not much has changed yeah. Although there have been advances made under the covers, yeah. but but for an overview, that's still fairly up to date. I think this actually, I think this is the first nanotechnology book I got. I got after this, I got Nano um, Medicine by Robert Fretzos. Yeah, this one really opened me up. I was like, wow, because you know my father has Parkinson's, and I was just interested in life assistance. That's what got me into all of this, and I, you know. It's been a great, it's been, it's been a really good, 
thing to learn. I, I'm really enjoying everything I'm learning. I'm glad you came by. I really appreciate it, Dr. Or. This was a treat. I'm telling you. This was a treat. I enjoyed your company. And when, Likewise. And when the hardcover comes back, I'm going to invite you. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to write you. I'm going to have questions for you. I'm going to have well. <laughs> I'm going to be very Can't wait. And I'm going to have you back great. on. We're going to discuss it. Um, anything else you want to tell my audience before we leave? Oh, you know um, what? Wait, hold that thought. Watch hold out for those Martians. <laughs> <laughs> what, what advice do you have for for any of the young hip hoppers that might listen to this who claim the lifestyle of the culture of hip hop but also want to get into nanotechnology? What, what advice do you have for them? Well, that's actually the toughest question you've asked me so far. Um, and it's a, it's a hard thing to say, but it's the one time I, I actually had a chance to talk to somebody who was, was basically in, in, in what you're talking about. Um, in, in my case, it was actually just a, a young school student who wasn't about to be able to go into science. Mm. Um, and what I said was, and I think this still rings completely true, mm. is just do it. Okay, it's like Nike, right? Let everybody know that's what you're interested in, and they'll help you. Right, right. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a simple thing to say, but it's true, and it, it People don't realize, especially kids, mm -hmm. don't realize that if you make a big deal out of how I like this and I want to do this, yeah, that's actually true. That everybody around you will try and help. Right, right. And and you'll make a difference. Mm. Thank you. Dr. John Store Hall, y'all. Please go cop go cop all his books and we'll definitely have him on on the show mm -hmm. again. Thank you, Dr. Hall. You have a great evening. It was a pleasure to, to be speaking to you today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, man. And you too. I love it. Thank you. One Take love. it easy. All right.